Where do you guys live? We live in uh, Abbott. Shaw and Abbott there. Oh, uh, we bought the house about three years ago. They don't care for about 18 One time when we fully moved that fair river on the pond, before we moved up here, we uh, stayed down at that the trail side place. Oh, yeah. yeah. They've got these fat beds. Mostly, I think, they're still on their back. All right. All so. Oh, yeah. 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 So should we get started? Go for it. Okay. So I probably don't need to do an introduction. It seems like you know everybody, but this is Ed Linz. Um, he is an author, teacher, um, veteran, a lot of different, <laughs> a lot of different things, author, historian. So, um, so he's going to be uh, speaking today about um, his fourth book, which I think is your most recent book. It is, yeah. Um, and it's They Never Threw Anything Away. I was going to have our library copy here, but it's checked out. It's been checked out uh -huh. a lot almost That's since good. we got it. So it's been popular. So I will let you take the floor. Sure. Uh, Edmund, uh, I'm going to be speaking from the chair. I normally, as a teacher, was in student spaces and I like walking around and talking. But uh, I'll sit down here so that uh, folks can uh, see me that are not here today. Uh, a little bit about how this book came about. Uh, I, uh, my, my mom and dad were both children of the depression. Actually, my dad wasn't so much a child because he was born in 1898. Uh, but uh, I, being a self-absorbed youngster, I, of course, did not talk to them about their lives, uh, mostly about baseball and things like that. And my mom was a nurse, and we talked a lot about medicine. But uh, my dad passed away in 1970, and I'd always been upset that I didn't talk to him because he was born in 1898, went to the third grade, but then had to quit to go to work on a horse-drawn milk wagon. My uh, mom was a registered nurse, born in 1914, and she passed away in an auto accident in 1991. So uh, I just felt bad about that, but simultaneously to feeling bad, I got sick. Uh, I got sick and uh, diagnosed with this terrible disease. It's in my book, Life Row over there, a case study of how a family can survive a medical crisis. And uh, was given two years to live. And so uh, writing and things like that were taking a big back seat to my life. However, I successfully uh, thank God, and due to my donor, Monica, uh, received a heart in 1994. And uh, then I could start, as I, I started writing that book, but I couldn't go back to teaching because I was immunosuppressed. And uh, because I couldn't go in, like, well, come on in. Come on. No, no. Uh, I was in the classroom. Uh, I couldn't go back with that virus factory. So I decided, well, this is the time when I can make up for previous sins. I can't talk to my parents, but I can talk to other people who lived during that era. So I went around the country and started interviewing people who uh, had lived during the depression. Some of the people, as you will see during my talk, uh, were recommended to me by people. You've got to talk to so-and-so. They had great stories. You've got to talk to them. Others, I just, it was serendipity where I would just walk along and I'd literally say, excuse me, how old are you? Uh, one you'll see about uh, the one-legged black guy. I was in the post office line in Key West, Florida. I was down there bone fishing with my brother-in-law. And I said to him, excuse me, sir, how old are you? Uh, he turned around, looked me up and down with pretty much disgust and said, what the hell is it to you? But by the time we got up to clerk, we're best friends and invited me over to his place. I'm surprised about how many people would invite you over to their house, <laughs> a total stranger. And one person I met on the street in Seattle, 10 minutes later, I'm up in an apartment talking to him. So uh, 
I went around the country and got roughly 40 stories. And they were all in cassette tape. And I also took notes. And so uh, when I uh, got finished, I thought, well, I'll start writing these. Well, then I, they wanted me to go back teaching. So I, I had already, was already coaching track and cross country. So I went back into the classroom teaching and that took, totally occupied me until 2011. And that's when I retired, but that's when I decided I wanted to write a novel. So I, can you hold that book up there, uh, Hurtling to the Edge, the one right there, that one, yeah. That, that book, I, it took me several years to write. It's a little racy. It's called A Thriller Involving Physics, Religion, Drugs, and Sex. Uh, one, and there is a submarine tie into it, just a little teaser on that. But uh, at any rate, uh, that took some time. So when I, last summer, I said, I've got all of those stories. So they were sitting literally in a big plastic tub. I brought the plastic tub up here to Maine, got a new set of headphones. The tape recorder actually worked, the tapes worked. And I listened to each of those tapes twice and took further notes on my notes. Uh, when, uh, when I got finished, I started writing stories one by one. Fortunately, I have spe a spectacular support force, one of which is Lynn, my neighbor, who I would funnel these stories to. Or, hi, come on in. I'd funnel these stories to her to give me her thoughts. I also had some remote friends who were reading the stories. One guy was a fact checker. Uh, Lynn, I called her the comma queen. Uh, Betty did a few things for me. I had some people down in Annapolis that were reading it. Anyway, that's how, the sto how these stories all came about. I learned I am not, I need to preface the rest of my remarks by saying I am not a professional historian. Uh, I am, I would describe myself best as a listener. Uh, I would talk to people and listen to their stories and record them. So what I have in my book is basically an oral history a la Studs Terkel of the Great Depression. And with that, I'd like to start my uh, presentation here with that background. Now, during the presentation, which of course isn't working, let's try enter and see if that works. Okay, I can't get it to move. Okay. Excellent. Just got it. Okay. That's what I was trying. All right. Uh, the book is They Never Threw Anything Away. That came from my mom, not from her words directly, but when she passed away in 91, like I mentioned, I went to her home with my son to clean it out. And there was a huge cardboard box in the basement full of absolutely pressed used tinfoil. She never threw anything away. And that was something that came from the Depression. The cover is very fascinating. Uh, I got the book, or I got the picture from, uh, I've got it sitting here, is it over here? Can you hold that one up, Lynn? The Walker Evans book. Uh, this photo is by Walker Evans, who was working for the government. Uh, and he and the, art, the uh, writer, James Agee, went down to live with, uh, some sharecropper, cotton sharecropper families in Hill County, Alabama, to document it for the government, what life was like on the farms at that time. He took a whole series of pictures, many of them are in that book, but I fell in love with his pictures. The guy that did the cover for me, he had a different picture and I said, no way. We had to doctor this one because in the original picture, the little boy's nightshirt did not cover his privates. So we Photoshopped it. And, uh, but I am, just attracted totally to the young girl's eyes. They're haunting, absolutely haunting. When you look at the book up close, you'll see that, but they're very haunting. Also, you can notice their legs are in real bad shape. The mother's got a grand, the grandmother has a pair of clodhoppers. 
And interestingly enough, uh, when I did research on it, the, the guy, it, it's, it's Bud, where the guy's name is uh, Bud, the, the father, but uh, Bud Adams, but his real name was William Edward, Edward but like a good old boy Southerner, he's called Bud. But we know his wife's name was Lily. The baby was Lillian, there's a, it in her arms. And the little boy is named William, but I haven't been able to find the name of the girl that really drew me to the picture. But uh, anyway, A.G. And, and him, they didn't get their work published in Fortune, but they did have a very best-selling book, famous book called Let Us Now Praise Famous Men that came out during the 40s. Uh, but that's the background of the picture there. A uh, few misconceptions that people have about the Great Depression. Uh, before, during the, the 20s, although they were, you know, called the boom, boom years, whatever you want to call it, they weren't so hot, it turns out, because they had an average of 600 banks that would fail every year. I'm not going to read this slide to you. I don't like to read PowerPoint slides, but you can peruse over it and see some of the things there. The one in bold print, we talk about income inequality today. <laughs> you ought to have seen it at that time. I mean, insanely rich people. Uh, one of the stories I have is about uh, a fella that I'll be talking about later who uh, the, lived out on Long Island and worked on one of these estates. This was one of the real, really insanely wealthy Wall Street bankers. But he worked out there, first of all, as a caddy and then also doing gardening on this place. Uh, you can see that the stock market, although it went up during 29, it hit a peak on September 3rd, and it sort of gradually slid down, and then the crashes occurred, where they called them Black Thursday, Black Monday, Black Tuesday, and it went all the way down to 46, and did not recover for 25 years. So if you see the market going south now, uh, hold your breath, okay? Uh, things could happen. Uh, it... So did it begin in 29? Well, that's the year everyone thinks of with the market crashes. But there were several troughs that occurred during the 30s where it looked like things were getting better. And then all of a sudden, boom, everything crashed again. It was not a big go down to a hole and stay there until the, excuse me, the war came in. It had a whole, things got better then they'd get a lot worse. So it was, it was, it was a very difficult decade. Just to give you a sampling of some of the numbers. And you can see that the average income hit sort of a low in 33, uh, but went up a couple hundred to in 38. Uh, new car prices actually rose during that time. Part of that was because there were, in addition to the Fords and the Model A's, Model T's, and all these things, car companies started producing expensive cars. And so that's why the average price of a new car actually went up. The price of a house went down because no one could afford it. And uh, bread stayed pretty stable at nine cents, milk fairly stable, gas about 10 cents. And the Dow Jones average was at 311 and then went to 84 and then it got up to 132 in 1938. Here are some of the people that I talked about in the book that I actually interviewed. Uh, Vorta May there uh, on the uh, left, I called it Dust Bowl to Rice Bowl because she was actually the child living out in the Dust Bowl. And she ended up actually working for the CIA, its predecessor in China. That's why I called it Dust Bowl to Rice Bowl. I met her she, at a luncheon for the George Washington University Hospitals Women's Club, of which I was the only male member. I got to be, and I was invited to be, be a member because I have a woman's heart, literally, from my heart transplant. So I was sitting next to Vorta May, and she invited me over to her apartment, which was in the Watergate, same for the famous Watergate uh, there in DC. And we talked, as you can see, she had a book about China behind her. The whole place was decorated in China uh, artifacts and paraphernalia. Uh, but she was a very interesting character. 
uh, some of her stories were a touch racy, okay? Uh, as you'll see about uh, her father, uh, her mother died when she was young and her father uh, had companions who would come in. And so she talks about these various things, but very interesting person. John Torrin uh, is the fellow from Long Island that worked for the rich guy. He and his brother actually started a big band. I mean, a big band. Those are fake tuxes, by the way, that they wear. They was just the upper part was a tux. But they, uh, his brother, who was younger than him, was actually the band leader. And they would play gigs at all the speakeasies on Long Island uh, during that time. And uh, he, uh, they bought those instruments at a second-hand store in New York. They'd save up their money, go into New York to one of the instrument places and get second-hand instruments. But the younger brother, who was like 19, was hiring the comedians, the dancers. They even have a few strippers and stuff like that. But it, they put on the whole show. They're 19 years old uh, doing this. Uh, but... Uh, he, he was a very interesting guy. Uh, Arlen Babcock is a really sad story. He's from out in Wenatchee, Washington. I'll talk more about him later. But he, uh, his father deserted him right after his mother died when he was young. And so he literally got shuttled from aunt to aunt to aunt. There's a great quote coming up about that later on here. But uh, he... Uh, Arden was literally on his own pretty much his whole life. At 15, he left his one aunt and ended up in Wenatchee, Washington, and was literally working in a whorehouse, sweeping the floors. And one of the ladies working in there said to him, this is no place for a young boy like you. You need to get a family. He said, well, I'd love to get a family. She said, well, put an ad in the paper. He put an ad in the paper and a family answered it and took him in and that became his mom and dad. So uh, very interesting guy. J.C. Evans, that's a black guy. That's one-legged black guy uh, that, that I met in the Key West thing. I call him Turpentine Man because he worked in the Turpentine Forest in Southern Georgia. I think I talked about him later, but if not, I'll come back to him because he's a very interesting guy. I learned far more about turpentine that I ever wanted to know, far more about that. Uh, Eleanor Bowen is the most beautiful picture of the whole group. That's when she was young. She, yeah, don't you think she's strikingly, strikingly, beautiful? strikingly beautiful. This is the mother of, well, it's actually the mother-in-law of one of my close friends who has since passed away. And uh, his, wife, who I might add, is not that good looking, uh, but uh, she, at least compared to her, her the mother had all of you. She's from New Bedford, Mass, and uh, was, had vivid memories of the uh, 38 uh, hurricane that came through southern New England and pretty much wiped everything out. But these are just a few of the stories. I'm going to go on to some others here. Uh, Diana Peminets, Greek immigrant. Her father came over. Let's see what time he came over. I got it. Well, he went through Ellis Allen in 1909 and ended up within four years, he's got his own Greek restaurant and had this happen, but all financed by fellow Greeks, as a lot of our immigrant groups did and probably still continue to do, where they help each other out. Moved out to LA and was living in Long Beach during the earthquake that occurred there. Uh, and I've, in the book, there's a picture of some of the devastation from that earthquake. It was bad. All the buildings were made out of brick and not really up to specifications. And the good news is it occurred like at four something in the afternoon when the kids were out of school because most of the local schools all crashed in. So uh, it was very fortunate that happened. But Diana's the one with a hand on her chin. And uh, 
She, uh, when she was nine, when she was nine years old, she was, was diagnosed with tuberculosis. I contend, I put make an aside in the book that it may have been from drinking a lot of raw milk. You can get tuberculosis from drinking raw milk. And uh, at any rate, she was diagnosed with it. And she was put into a Catholic uh, sanitarium there in LA with what she described as the meanest nuns on earth uh, that would actually slap them all the time, scream at them. She said that the food had bugs in it and uh, it was not very good. good. The, the one nun she described would scream at these little girls saying, don't touch me, I'm holy. Okay, I mean, really interesting. But she rebounded from that. Interestingly, a couple of the women that I talked to, actually, they met their, their first dates with guys. They'd take them up in an airplane. And uh, I didn't do that <laughs> when I was young, but and I doubt that many of you did. But that was a big thing then. And new airplanes were so new, you could really impress a young lady by taking her up in the airplane. Uh, that didn't end well for her. She got divorced. But uh, the guy went into the Marines and maybe fathered half the people in Okinawa. I don't know. But at any rate, they got divorced. And so, uh, but she rebounded and married another guy and became very wealthy with Greek restaurants and nightclubs in both LA and in San Diego. Uh, she, and you'll see in the book, also had several friends in show business that would come and to their nightclubs and talk to them as really good friends with them and stuff like that. But she uh, was an interesting character. Uh, this guy, Jim, was born in Indiana. And let's see what year I got in. He was born in 1909, one of the older people that I interviewed. And he uh, didn't have any money, like most people, but he heard that the phone company needed some people stringing wire. Uh, and so since I, we're getting a lot of wire strung along our road right now, for the, it was a similar job. But he'd travel all over and all over India. He got a car. All these guys, his son and the women, would always want to tell me about their first car. I mean, yeah, that, that was a big deal. Uh, Jim uh, gave me an aside saying, this is a great job because as he traveled all over Indiana, everywhere he went, he knew all the lady phone operators, the ones that would actually be plugging the cords in as you call up. I, I had a, did any of you ever live on a party line? Uh, I, I live, mine was a 10 person party line. My ring was four shorts. Uh, but you know, I, I, many of you may have done the same thing where any, if you're bored, you pick up the phone and listen to the other conversation. That was a big sport, you know. Especially if you were a kid. Exactly. Well, it was tough for me trying to date knowing that every one of my neighbors was listening to my phone call, you know, and how I was getting shot down, you know. <laughs> but he uh, got laid off during the depression and he was being paid, had options for AT&T stock, which had a par value of a hundred bucks, but he was getting it for a lot less than that. So he signed his AT&T stock over to his sister who was a school teacher. Being a school teacher was a good deal during the depression. And I'm gonna talk about that some more. But you had a job and you could often support your whole family on this stuff. But you didn't get paid much and a lot of it was in one room schoolhouses. But uh, he went to embalming school in Cincinnati. And a guy up in Buffalo uh, needed an embalmer and contacted the school. And the day he graduated, he got in a train. He had never knew, didn't know anything about Buffalo. Just got on the train. We got up there. He didn't have any snowshoes or anything. And it was like a foot of snow and he didn't have a coat. And when he finally got over to the guy's the funeral home, the guy said to him, 
put that coat on, get to work. We got a funeral in the morning. So, so he immediately started embalming. It was a Catholic funeral home. What do I mean by that? Uh, at that time, uh, Catholics went to a Catholic funeral home. It'd be like a moral sin to go to a Protestant funeral home and vice versa. So he told me, once again, more than I ever want to know about how you embalm. And the difference between doing it in a person's home and doing it in the funeral park. As a matter of fact, he ended up with a funny story in there about how he met his wife. One of his buddies had been out to a party with his girlfriend and they had a girl with her and they stopped and he met his wife. They came into the funeral home while he was embalming someone. <laughs> really romantic way to, to meet your spouse. Uh, he also told me a funny story about what you have to do to when a nun dies. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you now, but I mean, that's a little teaser there, but really funny story about what you do. But he did cardinals, bishops and everything else uh, for that. He ended up uh, also being over in, he got married and they got married over uh, in a place where Nelson Rockefeller had been buried by the same, same guy. But anyway, long story, but uh, interesting guy. I really like him here. Uh, I think I actually interviewed him out in Arizona. Uh, this is one of my favorites, Mary Jeanette Roberts. Uh, she was born in uh, 1906, and her father wasn't home when she was born because the mother's sister did the delivery. When he came home and saw that he was a girl, he got enraged, and he said, I don't care what you call her, I'm calling that baby Bill. And uh, so she also, in the story, <clears throat> some very interesting stories about how she hated, hated uh, Missouri. Uh, she was wearing, and I maybe uh, you can help me on this. She was wearing a dress made out of, what was that material that catches fire easily? Didn't come on. So, so no, no, no. She was wearing. Uh, I can't remember the name of that fabric. That no, wasn't taffeta. Uh, I'll look it up. Anyway. anyway, she was at a picnic and wearing this fancy, very crisp dress made out of this cotton material. No, no one criminal. And caught caught fire. Got burned really badly. She started running. That made it worse. Her mother let, threw her on the ground and rolled her. Out, but she had some very severe burns and almost lost her. The doctor said, I have to amputate. And they said, no, there was a lady there, I think an Indian or somebody who had some special cures that they put on and stuff. Anyway, so uh, this is one of the few pictures of her uh, where she did not have a long sleeves on. Uh, but she became a teacher and would, in these country schools, one room, you got there early in the morning. You started the fire. You warmed the place up. You uh, did everything. One year, she had like nine students. Another year, she had uh, some Mexican immigrants who were there. And one of the little boys was throwing spitballs at the board. So when recess came, she pulled him aside in, in broken English and her broken Spanish told this boy he had to stay and make a thousand spitballs. Well, the sixth grade brother was hanging around and he came up, got behind her and put a knife to her throat and said, my brother's not making spitballs. Fortunately, there was an eighth grade sister who saw this and came running in and said, put that down, don't harm you know, Miss Roberts, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, uh, but she loved teaching uh, in these country schools. Uh, I could identify a bit in that uh, when I moved out of the country, I was in a three-room classroom uh, where first and second were together, third, fourth, and fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. And we had a 19-year-old novitiate nun teaching 52 children in that classroom. Uh, Hers were much smaller, but uh, very interesting stories she got 
about she has about all of her experiences in the country schools. There's another one. It was also in the country. And by the way, you could not marry. That was a rule then. And that rule lasted right up into the war. You, if you were a school teacher, you could not marry. I don't know about librarians. Okay, don't know. Okay. But you could not marry if you were a school teacher. If you got married, you got fired. And uh, yeah, well, they didn't want you to become pregnant or anything else, but that, that was the rules. And that was just universal, just about in many of the states. Uh, okay, this lady, not everyone was poor. This lady was rich. Her father was a big exec with the BNO, even had his own rail car. And so when they would go on vacation, they'd get into the father's rail car and travel and lecture. Her father was John Stevens, the chief engineer who built the Panama Canal. He rescued it when it was floundering and for Roosevelt, went down there, figured out how to do it, how to get rid of the mosquitoes and everything. In 1930, he took Virginia. Virginia was, let's see when she was born. Hold on, I got a note here on that. She was born in 1910, so she was 20 years old. He took her on a steamship down to Panama. They were celebrities. I mean, treated like royalty. Well, first of all, they stayed in the hotel that her grandfather had built for Roosevelt when he came down there. And uh, so uh, she also was a very good friend of the actress and dancer, Ginger Rogers. In fact, Rogers actually loaned her limo one time in New York. So interesting character, uh, Virginia. Uh, so not everyone was doom and gloom uh, during the depression. Uh, I also interviewed some interesting religious groups. Uh, these were Anabaptists. Now, if you haven't read my book yet, does anyone, can anyone tell me what an Anabaptist is? Anybody know what an Anabaptist is? No, they're not Mormons. That's a, a different sect. Uh, the Anabaptists began in Europe. Uh, no, they're not Quakers. The Quakers were a different group too. They, these are people associated with the Mennonites. Actually, the Mennonites, you may not know this, but the name came from a European guy named Menno Simon, who had the unique ability to really, really annoy both the Pope and Martin Luther. Both of them wanted him killed. And they'd be in fighting and there was a lot of battles and stuff like that. But to be an Anabaptist means that they are violently opposed to infant baptism. You can only be baptized when you have reached the age of reason where you and you alone can make the decision to become a Christian. That's the unique thing about Mennonites. Uh, and and uh, oh, what's the other one in Pennsylvania? Amish. Amish and Mennonites are very closely related. As a matter of fact, there's all these different sects. And I explain it in the book, but Mennonite Amish, there's this guy, there's another guy that I interviewed at the same time as he's named Daniel Beachy. There are Beachy Mennonites, uh, all of them, and they all have different rules depending upon who their current bishop is. Some have cars. Not everyone has a buggy. Some has cars. Some have electricity coming to their house. A lot don't have electricity because that's because they don't want to be connected to, as they called it, the English. So, but he had some, inter they had very interesting stories about how they met, et cetera, and how they did their services, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, financially, the depression wasn't that bad for them, except this fellow here, his father lost a thousand dollars, which is a huge amount of money when one of the banks closed. I got several bank closing stories in the book about how one person missed it by a day she went up to get her money out and the bankers tried to talk her out of it. And she, they learned why, because the bank closed the next day. And so, uh, but she, 
actually was able to retrieve her money. So that, that was good. Uh, the, I also talked to Mormons, to answer your question. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Mormons that I talked to out, were out in the Arizona Pioneer Home, uh, where, which was a gold mine for me in terms of talking. I had several interviews, but I didn't publish all of them. But I did publish the one about the Mormons. Uh, very fascinating. The, the Mormon, the grandfather of the fellow I talked to actually came across with Brigham Young. And of course he gave me his version of the beginning of Mormonism with Joseph Smith there in, Ever in New York State. But uh, I know a lot about Mormonism because my, several of my students when I was teaching were Mormons and we would talk about it and everything. So I, I became a student of that. I mean, by the way, I don't, did any of you ever hear, you know, you've all heard of the Book of Mormon. You've heard of the New Testament, the Old Testament. Well, those are three of the books that the children have to learn almost by heart. The fourth one, tell me if you've heard of this, the Doctrines and Covenants. Doctrines and Covenants, you've heard of it. I've heard of it. I don't know that much about it. Well, it's it's basically a series of numbered writings uh, by Joseph Smith, where he would receive visions by looking into this black box. Oh yeah. And then his wife would transcribe them and write them down. And they were such mundane things as he had some people out in Missouri. One of them was a route they should take through Cincinnati to get up to Ohio, where there was another group of Mormons up there. Just Monday. But the one I like is 132, which, and I always wanted, I would love to have seen, have a video of the wife's face when he read number 132 saying that he could marry the young chick next door, plus every other woman in town. Uh, you know, I think she's probably right and said, what? Are you sure, Joseph? You know, you got that right? <laughs> but anyway, uh, anyone know what type of airplane that is? This guy was an interesting guy. This is one of the fellows I met out in Seattle. Uh, that's on the roof of his apartment building after I interviewed him. That plane is a Curtis Wright pusher, sometimes called a junior. The actual blade, I don't know if you can see it on there, is actually in the back underneath the wing. And that's killed several people uh, that started and then forgot that it was there and then clipped them when, it, when they were getting in and out of the plane. Uh, but uh, that's one of the early planes we flew. He used to like barnstorm and stuff like that. And interesting stories, uh, like that. I got one story out of Seattle where a guy was working his way through college. I don't remember if it's Ken or not, I don't think, who worked in a, I think it was Ken. He got a job working for a guy making wine, 5,000 gallons of Loganberry wine every weekend. That's what he would do. And one day he dropped his pocket knife into the vat of wine. And he's got this big decision. Do I not tell anyone, but I'm afraid it's metal. It's gonna rush, it's gonna ruin that wine. So he jumped into the vat, went, went under water, under wine, picked up it, found this thing with his feet, picked up the knife and came out and never told anyone. But he said it took him a couple of days to not be purple. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a little interesting aside, I can identify with that because on one of the submarines that was on Gennard, pulled into Seattle, one of the bars, what well, was in Seattle, was over in Bremerton. One of the bars over there was a submarine bar. Wherever, wherever submarines pulled in, it's okay, Sherry. Whenever, whenever submarines would pull into a port, uh, there was always a submarine bar. And uh, the favorite drink was called Logie and Ole, which was half this purple Loganberry wine and half Olympia beer. And in the morning, one way or another, you were all purple. Okay, from that minute. Anyway, that story about Ken. This is the turpentine man. I got a picture there you can see of he, JC was in charge of 7,300 trees. 
in one of the turpentine forests in Southern Georgia. He told me he loved the depression because he always had a job when he wanted it. Uh, to me, it sounded like slavery. They're all black guys. They're all living in a dorm called the Turpentine Dorm. He said, but they didn't cheat us. They fed us, housed us, and paid us. And I saved all my money. And I would buy a, a different car every two years. I was the most popular black guy in town. He didn't use black guy, is what he said. But uh, here's a picture of these guys. And it's not the sap. It's not like when you get maple syrup. It's not the sap. It's you put these slits in the tree. And it's this resin that comes out of the bark. So you collect that in a bucket. And then a guy comes along with a wagon and put you put your to put the tin bucket you did into a bigger bucket. They put the big bucket on the horse-drawn wagon. They take the horse-drawn wagon down to the distillery and distill this stuff and makes turpentine. But a byproduct is rosin that's in the rosin bags on baseball pitching mounts. That's where it comes from. Speaking of pitching, did any of you ever hear of the king and his court? Yes. Okay, Eddie Fainham. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, very. Two of my stories are tied to Eddie Fainham. One called the ball player, and the other one, this character, <laughs> incredible character uh, that I don't think I talk about right here. I don't have any pictures of it, called Walt for Walt's pickups. Most of that interview was his profanity talking about, he used a lot of colorful adjectives, but Fainer was one of his relatives, I guess cousin. And he knew a lot about Fainer, but I've seen Eddie Fainer play many times. It was a, a four person fast pitch softball team that would barnstorm around the country playing all-star teams. And they hardly ever lost. I mean, this guy would pitch blindfolded from second base. Of course, I'd be a little worried about being a batter. But uh, at any rate, there's two of the stories that are tied to this. But uh, JC uh, loved the work. He loved talking to me about it. Uh, he ended up, guys would, these, the, the reason that they treated him so well is they were a very valuable commodity. Got other people, particularly down in Florida that had turpentine forests, forests wanted these guys because it was a real skill set and a very difficult hard work i might add to be able to do this and they'd try to come and poach him so they treated him real well and uh anyway he lost his, he was working in his 80s and lost his leg in a construction accident he was like when i went over to his house he was living with a lady who i would charitably describe is somewhere between 30 and 60 uh who uh my brother-in-law was with me. I think she was a hooker. He took her out in the town to get drinks and while well, I could talk to the guy. But she was so sweet and a wonderful person. And I loved her very much. She's a very, very, very nice person. And uh, so I got to meet a lot of interesting characters in doing this. My favorite story is the last one in the book about the girls. Uh, some interesting names from the time. Ida Lee, Mary, of course. Uh, Bessie, her name, her last name was Bussy, her name was Bessie Bussy, and uh, her married name, and Ophelia. I call them the girls because my mother, who is on the uh, lower left corner, that's my mother, they were in nursing school together, but they never called it nursing school. At that time, everyone called it nursing training. And she got put on a train, went, she lived in a incredibly poor situation, mining in Western Kentucky. Everyone knows about the mines in Eastern Kentucky. There were also coal mines in Western Kentucky. And went up there, not having a cent. And your first year in nursing training at the time, you're essentially like a slave. Uh, you know, but you learn the trade right from bedpans on up. And by the time you are up is in the third year, you're basically the nursing crew for the hospital. Very few real nurses at this hospital all trained. I was born at that hospital, Spears Hospital, as a matter of fact. But all of these ladies came from pretty poor backgrounds in all different parts of Kentucky. 
And of course, the stories were very meaningful to me because I knew all of them because they were in the club where these ladies would meet once a month for every month, never missed it for anything, and no men were allowed at their gatherings, no men. My dad had to take me when we when mom would host it, take me away from it. But very interesting stories. A lot of stories about what nursing training was like in those days. Uh, some of the quotes that you can all probably have heard one way or another, uh, and that is, and I won't read them for you, but uh, the one, I walked the streets looking, but couldn't get a job doing nothing. This was a, there, there was a story I have in here about a lady called the Republican daughter. Her father was a very prominent judge and politician in Ohio. He helped get Warren G. Harding elected. Unfortunately, he died. And her brother, older brother, had a job as a postmaster, which was a plum because he was able to support the whole family. But it was a political job. So as soon as the Democrats came in, he lost his job as postmaster and the family was destitute. She had a small baby, but no husband. And she got divorced and no money and was living with her mother and over and went over to Columbus. And she, in a very poignant story, is carrying the baby, walking around the state house, the grounds in Columbus, trying to get up enough nerve to go in and beg for a job from one of her father's friends. She did get it, and that lasted until another change of administration. And she ended up working in one of the big hotels down there in Columbus, but a sign of the time, she could only enter the back door for her job, that sort of thing. Uh, the second last one, we were poor but clean, was what my mom always said to describe her situation. We were poor but clean. Uh, the one, one more mouth to feed was apparently one too many. That came from Arden, said those exact words to me when he got shuttled from aunt to aunt. That's what he said, that uh, apparently uh, one too many. Uh, a few common themes. Cars, as I mentioned. Everyone wanted to tell me about their car, including one that I'd never heard of called a Hupmobile, H-U-P-M-O-B-I-L-E, a Hupmobile. I don't think your wife's even heard of that. Okay. But uh, it was, and I described what these cars are, but very, very fascinated about their cars. And that was their way of breaking out of the 19th century. They could now go places. They could now see things. One of the stories after they got married, one of the school teachers, her husband was also a school teacher. They put a mattress in the back seat and went off, take, took off on a road trip up to, uh, oh, what's the national park in Wyoming? Yellowstone and everything. And I mean, but, Cars were a big deal. Whenever you had a natural disaster, that was imprinted, like on Diana, that's all she could talk about was that it, let me show you the pictures of this earthquake. Uh, floods, uh, my, the ladies, the girls, all I ever heard growing up and from the girls, the same thing went on and on talking about the 37 flood. The lady that had the hurricane come through that wiped everything out in lower New England, the 38 hurricane. So those make a real impression. So, I mean, that's why when I hear stories now about, you know, climate change and stuff like this, and because people see it as a, a natural weather occurrence, and they say, oh my God, the climate change. Well, all I will say is they've been around for a long time. And uh, everyone thinks it's the first time it's ever happened to them and that sort of thing. Uh, a lot of children worked but they always have to come home and give that money to their parents. It's not like now, you know, you go out and make some money, okay? And uh, so, I mean, that not, no slam fault, but you know, I'm just saying, but you may or may not, if you make money, give it to your parents, okay? <laughs> but, yeah, but that was expected, that was expected. 
uh, my dad always told me he had to come home and put, and he made a nickel, he had to put it in his mom's apron, that sort of thing. Uh, but basically, if you had a job, you're basically okay. And uh, some of the occupations, you know, in nursing and teaching were really good. Farming, not so good because of natural disasters like the Dust Bowl era out there. And you could lose your money. Most of these guys could lo lose everything. And uh, banks had no trouble taking it. And it just sit idle. It's terrible. But a lot of social interaction. Uh, sometimes I get some stories about people who pay a nickel to go to the movies and stuff like that. But mostly there were picnics and gatherings and social interaction. Well, people actually talked instead of you know, doing this. So uh, anyway, uh, final thoughts, and that is my thoughts, and that is some interesting parallels. Well, we had a huge pandemic. Some of my people I interviewed, their parents died during the Spanish flu epidemic. Well, we got our own pandemic right now. They had 700,000. That's about what the, to the total right now, I wrote it down someplace. I don't know if I wrote it down how many it is now, but it's, we're up about 650,000 or so now. So parallel, yeah, stock market going crazy. Yeah, it hit a high yesterday, okay. Uh, so yeah, 612,000 is what it was on there. Uh, political turmoils, I don't need to talk about that. I mean, we're seeing that all the time. And if you listen to the central bankers back then, no problem, we got it in hand. Well, I'm pretty much certain that's what the chairman of the Federal Reserve is saying too. Okay, so just give you a few thoughts to keep you awake tonight. Maybe that's sort of thing. Uh, any questions? Any questions or comments about anything I said about this whole era? Does anyone? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question concerning our previous book that we wrote. Well, I am the president of the next week. Yeah. I'm sorry, what is it? The fires across the here that name burn. Oh, really? My question for this time is that we're seeing a lot of extremely, extremely wealthy, wealthy people this time of the depression. I'm wondering what they themselves did, aside from some of the more wealthy people that had hotels and hotels, they would hire. Those that were at the bad job. What did they do? Have you run into any um, investigatory work as to how these extremely multi-billionaires, what did they do to help in general people in depression? Or did they not? No, they did. I can tell you for a fact. Uh, because these guys like stuff. For example, they build a golf course. Well, they'd hire a lot of local people to maintain the golf course. They had servants that would travel with them even on these trips. I think I'm meaning more on um, an old USA, USA, well, that time was territories, but some of the time. What did they do more, not globally, but within the entire state, not the locale, like the book that we are reading, right. um, read the spires, everyone helped everyone, everyone. Every single person, whether they were wealthy or they were poor, they looked after their neighbor. Is that the way you're saying that they looked after a few I, of hiring them to caddy in their golf courses? Or was there more of a, a statewide agency post? I'm curious. I, I, don't, I haven't read that yeah. there was that much involved. To answer your question, based upon what I've read and seen, there was not a lot of altruism. And the fact that they were hiring people to do stuff they wanted them to do. I don't know that they were setting up soup kitchens or anything else. What I do know is, is that common ordinary people would often share. One of my stories involves a fellow that hitchhiked to Florida. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think it was the embalmer before he began embalming school on the trains when they would get jump the trains uh, to ride the trains, the freight trains. Everybody knew in which town, when you got out, where to go to get food. So these were not the wealthy guys providing food. 
These were ordinary citizens. I think that one of the reasons that a lot of these guys were hated, uh, like JP Morgan and people like that, was that they did not seem to share a whole lot. Uh, I don't think they're, you know, we, we now have like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and stuff like that. Uh, I, they would sponsor philanthropic efforts like the opera and stuff like that, but not necessarily where they could get their name on the building sponsored by whatever. But I don't think, I did not read anywhere where they had a significant outreach to people. Yeah, out, outreach to people. I, I don't know. Oh, yes. I, I talk in the book about the WPA, the Works Project, Progress Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, several of the people that I talked to actually had jobs in them. One of the school teachers said she was angry because she she was the one of the country school teachers that the guys working on the roads for the WPA were making more than she was. But for the people that were working, generally speaking, these were godsend. The CCC, you're paid 30 bucks a month, but you only got five of it. 25 was sent directly to your parents. And so, uh, and I have been involved in several CCC projects, uh, like a, I used to coach cross country track and we would go up to West Virginia to get Cape and State Park. That was built by the CCC. Beautiful wooden structures up there, but it provided employment for all these guys. And I might add, they were run like the army often had an army officer that was in charge of a particular group of these young men. And I think it helped mold them uh, to become better people and responsible citizens. But you could only be in that for so long. Uh, then the Work, Works Progress Administration was expanded to doing artists and things like that. It wasn't just hard labor, but this was a godsend for many of the people. They didn't give them money, they gave them a job and dignity, uh, which, which seemed to work real well during that era. Um, we have another question. Yes, um, go ahead, outside. go ahead. No. Um, there's much research, I'm very, very curious, where you have said that um, Martin Luther King and the Post of the Black Not Martin Luther King, I misspoke, Martin Luther. This was back, well, no, it was back in the 1500s. No, no, no not Martin Luther, no. Martin Luther, I, and the Pope, the Pope, oh, the Pope's then were not particularly holy guys, but they had a price on this guy's head. Oh, you can find that online. You can find it online. Yeah, just go, Google that guy's name, Mena. And it's a Google Anabaptist. They had actual wars where uh, the Anabaptists went in and killed 300 people. And then, so, I mean, there was a lot of bad blood. They go into hiding and this, I mean, it was a turbulent time, very turbulent time, period of time. But I thought it was interesting about how each of these various religions began, generally over some dispute over uh, scripture and how to interpret it. And of course, nothing has changed <laughs> on that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How did uh, John Stevens get rid of the mosquitoes that I came up now? A lot of things involving chemicals and draining. They, if you, there, I can't remember. Does anyone remember the really famous book about the Panama Canal? I can't remember it right now. Uh, it's in my book. I don't use footnotes or anything in here, but there's a, a really famous author wrote a really famous book about the Panama Canal. And it tells you everything you possibly wanted to know about how they did that. All the other people have been unsuccessful, but this guy, Stevens, was very single-minded. And he had actually earned his reputation in the West building railroads where people said they could not build railroads. 
I mean, this guy was an engineer and a thinker and tough taskmaster. But he made the decision about the current route of the canal using this lake and using locks to raise the ships up to that level. But uh, they pretty much cleared out all the mosquitoes. I've been in Panama recently and I didn't get a mosquito bite while I was down there. Now that's, you know, hundred years later. But uh, has anyone been down to the canal? It's, if you get a chance, it's a very fascinating tour. I mean, not tour, just go down there. Oh, I would say it reminds me of most Central American countries. Uh, it's more prosperous, far more prosperous than many of the other Central American countries. But uh, I enjoyed it very much. The weather was great. A uh, lot of history uh, there in Panama City. And uh, I was out in some of the villages and things like that. Uh, so it's, yeah, I, I go. It's a fairly inexpensive place to visit. You know, it's interesting, yeah, is when my sister and I were young, uh, we, we didn't we didn't have a lot of money as kids were all sure. up and, and so we, we where was it? In New Britain. And okay, we, New Britain, yeah. And we uh, we were raised on powdered milk. Oh yeah. And my grandmother, our grandmother had uh, the milkman deliver whole milk to her house every day. Yep. And we went over we, and she was very kind, very generous, but we yeah. asked her come in. When, when we would ask for a glass of milk, she'd give us a little glass like this. And you couldn't have seconds because she was very uh, oh yeah, very tight about no. and that was a, a product of you know the depression. When I got to Great Lakes and got to boot camp, I'd stand at the milk machine and drink <laughs> the milk. Uh, but then we just found that interesting. She she gave you the shirt off her back, but when it came to her milk. Well, I got in this book, I've got some serious stories to educate you about milk uh, and how several of the families went and they about what type of milk comes from what cows. I thought milk was milk. Well, they, the different breeds of milk have different concentrations of the butter fat in it. And I did not know that. And many of the families would just drink skim milk because they'd sell the cream. They would did not want whole milk. They they all drank skim milk and would sell that cream because that was they could sell that. That was a big cash crop for them. Yes, and make butter. Yeah, everything like that. Yes. Yes, sir. I thought you named the book after me because. I'm a hoarder. I have to recycle a piece of, piece of uh, paper. There you go. Well, I uh, I grew up in that whole atmosphere, believe me. And uh, my mother always said, uh, take as much as you want, but you've got to eat everything on the plate. And I made a mistake one time. We had, I still vividly remember this. I don't know the correct, I guess the correct name is, I know the Navy name for it, but it was cream beef form toast. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Cheddar yeah. Shank. Yeah. Right. Well, my mom served that one night and I could not stand it. And that was the rule. You, it's on your plate, you eat it. So I'm sitting there and they, they finish and I still have to sit at the table. So I'm taking each piece of this little beef off and wiping it with my napkin, trying to get all the cream off of it. And then, I mean, it took me an hour to finish that meal, but that was one of our rules. You know, you did not, you didn't, we didn't have table scraps. We may have had some leftovers, but there was no such thing as a table scrap and sort of thing. I assume that it's the same across the country, but I don't know that. But I know here in Greenville, during the Depression, my grandfather was a logger. Um, of course, there were a lot of people that came here because there were jobs in the woods logging. Yeah. But also, they took in borders. Oh. A lot of people took in borders. Put something to have a place, and then they had to help out around the place or on the farm or 
go to work and sit there. But people took care of each other and they took care of their children. Something really? happened to yeah. the parents. People would take care of their children and raise them up. Well, I have a story from this one fellow out west that uh, he, his mom was going through, uh, was in it, getting some special training for a year as a teacher, and he moved in with his aunt for a year. Also, there's a story out of Pennsylvania, uh, a very interesting guy who worked as a caddy up there. His father was a stonemason, so he became a stonemason. And, but when he, during one of these terribly cold winters, he, they had a fairly nice house. They moved out of it and rented it for $25 a month and moved into a place for like 10 bucks a month where the air was blowing through it. But he and his wife did that to get some extra money. So uh, they, they, we could learn a lot by what these people went through and everything. And I'd be lying if I said, I was, you might say, uh, optimistic about what would happen if we have this sort of situation now. I have a quick question. Yes, ma'am. Um, when did you say the teachers weren't able to be married or whatnot? That was just standard practice all the way up until the war. Uh, when the war came along, all the men got drafted, went off, and they realize that if they wanted teachers, the teachers suddenly had a lot more, the female teachers had suddenly had power. I just asked because my grandmother was very poor prior to the depression. She uh -huh. lived in one, she had five sisters, one room house, third floor, it was really bad. Yeah. And she went to school one day and her teacher, she was like first, second grade, her teacher was like, asked her if she wanted to come live with her and help take care of her children. Oh. So my grandmother left school that day wearing the, I think it was potato sack bag. Like yeah, they, they bag. use those. They and use flower sacks. sacks. Yeah. And um, she went home with her teacher to this beautiful house with her teacher and had two small children. And her she was only like eight or something, nine, eight, somewhere. And to take help take care of the school teacher's children. And she went to bed that night in a real bed. I woke up the next morning. She had a pair of shoes that were her size, and the teacher had stayed oh. her all night and sewed her two dresses. And she lived with her up until she married my grandfather. Wow! Oh, wow! And she put the kids right through, took care of those two little girls right through. What's what state was that in? Maine, next there. Well, see, Maine may have been more enlightened. I, I'm not sure. I the teacher did not have a husband. Yeah, I I once again I don't know. I do know that in the Midwest and in the South in particular, that was a hard and fast rule. I do not know about New England, about what the rules were oh, it, up here. It may have been different, but I do know that in those, I know for a fact that it, it went out in the, uh, when the, during the war years. Yeah, this would have been like the early mid 30s. Yeah, I, I don't know. Can't comment. Don't know. Any other questions? Yes, sir. What brings you up here to Greenville? We have a camp right right over here on Laura Wilson Pond. I got some of my neighbors here right now. Yeah, there you go. And uh, well, ask the young man behind you. He asked if you caught any fish. And what do you want, perch? Well, then then don't go. Uh, no, they the. They're all out, they're in that place. They're out in a hole out in the middle, a 120 foot deep hole. But I don't know how to catch them out there. I, I fish out of a kayak. So I don't know how to catch them. Also, you were here the first, I can tell you for three, four years, I've been trying to catch anything living in that lake on the yesterday's day before the back. I told him where to catch them. <laughs> <laughs> when, the, when the water is colder, I think that's in the different areas. So. And the water gets quite warm to go deep. I mean, if we're talking the same as trout and stove. You like the hook shot out of the canoe line with a fly rod. I'm in the spring. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, I have caught uh, trout here in that lake in May, but not, never after that. Yeah. I caught one the other day, a trout, I think it was by accident. I think it was transiting somewhere and, 
accidentally got hooked. But, um, well, listen, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed talking to each of you. If you would like to get a copy of the book, I have some here I can sign for you. Uh, and, uh, and I also have uh, my novel, which I said is a little racy over there, uh, which is available. But uh, thank you very much for it. And thank our host, uh, Laura, for everything. Thank you. Sure, sure. All right. Very nice. Thank you for coming. I need you to tell me how you need something. Oh, yeah, that'd be great. Can I put it in? Sure.